Yeah. I'll put on a show if I don't do that. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Yeah, the first session is always the toughest, doing the last minute setup stuff. <clears throat> We have uh, two schedules up here, and I'll just read it off real quick. It's the, the times are pretty much going to be the same. Tuesday morning, you're, we had breakfast at 8, or somebody had breakfast at 8. Uh, first session, now, 10 o'clock. Uh, dinner at 5, and then the second session, the evening session at 7. So tomorrow, Wednesday, breakfast at 8, and the third session at 10, dinner at 5, evening session 7. Thursday, breakfast at 8, morning session at 10, dinner at 5, yeah. <laughs> and then the evening session at 7. It's pretty much, oh, Friday's different. Friday, breakfast at 8, uh, first session at 10 and a wrap-up session at, I put it 11.30 because depending on how long the first session goes. <clears throat> so that's the schedule. So once again, good morning to everybody here. Good morning to anyone viewing online. If we have internet, the internet was kind of off and on <laughs> during the music. So I may be uploading these afterwards. <clears throat> All right. So everything's going, everything's recording, and and everybody's here. I uh, for for about a month, I'd say, at least, just the Lord would put you know something here on my heart, something there, and I would basically jot it down on a note. And I spent a good majority of uh, yesterday evening and the day before trying to organize all these little thoughts. <laughs> It's kind of crazy. The, the youth are going to be building an edible tabernacle. And it's going to be fun and exciting. And it was more work in my head than I thought. Actually, I'm finding out. So I had to like do a lot of preparing for that as well. But um, I'm glad everybody's here. I'm, I'm glad... I'm here, you guys that are here, right here in this place, and anyone listening online, I just want to say this, and I want you, I want you all to really consider this, uh, because it, it was really about a couple, couple days ago, about two days ago, the Lord really impressed this on my heart, is that he handpicked every single person who's here. So if you are here, consider it a miracle of God that you're here. I mean, he, he brought you here. He did. You who are viewing online, if you're online, he, I don't know what he did, what type of miracle for you to be even online. For you who will be hearing sessions later after the conference, the same thing. And why do I say it's a miracle? Because God and God alone is Christ-centered. I'm not, you're not, no one is. The Father and the Father alone exalts his Son, draws our hearts into his Son, and gives his Son the preeminence in our hearts, where unto us Jesus becomes everything, even as he is everything unto the Father. It will never change. Never. Um, Throughout eternity, we will be, I believe, we will be discovering just how much about Jesus it really is. The Father loves the Son. He loves the Son. He draws all to his Son. He doesn't draw to anything else. He uses different uh, means and methods to draw to his Son. Uh, let's say a miracle, a sign, a wonder. He'll use a preaching a teaching, a message, how about this, a spoken word, a prophetic word, he will use a healing, he will use whatever, and that whatever is called the provision. And God's provision will always serve God's purpose. 
And that purpose is to direct the attention of our heart, to turn our heart, to bring our heart, to guide our heart, because we, we have not gone this way before. Man cannot come this way. We must be led by the Spirit. We must be drawn by the Holy Spirit. And where he leads, where he guides, is unto Jesus, who is the truth. So, <clears throat> this is true, will forever be true, and I'm, I'm so thankful that, uh, that the Father shares his Son with us. I think one of the, one of the songs <laughs> that, that, that we sang was, there is no peace until the Prince of Peace comes. And, well, I won't say much because I may be treading on what might be in Wayne's heart share, but, <laughs> but peace is Christ. And see, once again, God and God alone is Christ-centered. And when we want peace, we want something down here that's going to steady our boat, that's going to steady our soul, that's going to steady our heart. Believe it or not, yes, Brother Wayne, I am carnal. <laughs> I misplaced a pen a couple days ago. I even texted Tony a picture of it. Help, help me find my pen. A pen. A pen. A pen. And it's like the Lord saying, hey, it's just a pen. I'm like, ah, my special. No, what was it? My precious. <laughs> no. No. There is no peace on the earth apart from his son. And the peace that you find on the earth is the peace that is found in your earth, which is your soul. The moment you're born again, peace has entered your soul. Life has entered your soul. Righteousness has entered your soul. Wisdom has entered your soul. Knowledge, understanding, all things have entered, all things of God have entered your soul in the person of his son. And I know we can agree with that. I know we can believe that. But there is a difference in believing that, in agreeing with that, and seeing that. Because even as carnal as I am, once I found my pen, everything was okay. And that's just something of the earth. How much greater his son. There were, uh, <clears throat> I, I was thinking about this when, because some of our, our youth have graduated or, and are off in, in college. So I was just thinking about the time when I was in college. I had this thought uh, when I, while I was uh, in college. My, I had a mindset. I had, I had a goal. And this was basically it. Uh, it was, I wasn't born again my first year, but this was my mindset. This was my goal. This was my thought process. It was get the grade and graduate, get the diploma so that I can do what I want to do. Take care of this so I can do this. In other words, clock in so I can clock out and go on, get this, go on with what I believed to be was my life at that time. Of course, I was defining life by breathing and everything else like that. I just didn't know God's definition. In God's mercy, I was born again. Uh, I became involved in Christian ministry at the time. I, be I became involved, heavily involved with what you call the miracle signs and wonders. If I didn't see a miracle happen during a service, look at, look, look at how ignorant we are. Well, okay, okay, not you guys. Look at how ignorant I am as a believer. If I didn't see a miracle happen during a service, my thought was God didn't show up. He's not here. So I need to pray harder so he can show up. If I didn't see someone healed during a service, the same thing. 
Now, I don't know how, how many years I could probably do the math and figure out how many years that, that I went through that. But after a while, at, a, at some point, I got bored. And I began thinking, if this is what it's all about, Lord, then I might as well go do whatever. I'm already bored of this. Well, I was, listen, I was bored of his provision because his provision is not the purpose. His provision serves his purpose. I didn't know that. No one told me that. Everybody was actually telling me that his provision was the purpose. And then by work of the Holy Spirit in my heart, I began crying out, probably like most and everybody of you here, there's got to be something more. There's got to be something more. There's, there's, there, there has to be something more because this is not satisfying. And it really never was meant to satisfy. I mean, Jesus fed the multitudes and, it's, and the scriptures say, and they were satisfied. And oh, wow, praise God. Jesus fed the multitudes and they were satisfied. But then in John, he says this because the multitudes, they're following him now. And he says this, you follow me not because of the signs, because the signs serve a purpose, right? Miracle, sign, wonder, healing, preaching, teaching, message, it all serves a purpose. He says, you're following me, but not because of the signs. You're following me because you ate of the loaves and you want more. And that's all you want. You might as well have said, and you will not come to me that you might have the true bread from heaven. I mean, he didn't say it there, but that's, that's ultimately what's, ha what's happening. And so I'm thankful to the Holy Spirit because he's the only one who is the spirit of truth, who is faithful, just as the Father is faithful, to continually work behind the scenes upon the ground of our heart to give us, well, not to give us, to make, to make us aware that we are truly not satisfied with our message, that we're truly not satisfied with our teaching, that we're truly not satisfied with our notes that we've studied. And at that point, I, I do it this way, we begin to drop our big stop sign and say, okay, Lord, I don't got it. I don't know what it's really all about. Because if I did, I would be satisfied. And like they talk about the, well, the Lord declares himself as the living water, the waters that satisfied and satisfied to this day. In Bible school, uh, my, like I said, in Bible school, I had a different mindset. Because remember, I had already done the, the world thing and well, the Lord showed up and the world thing kind of ended. <laughs> and then I did the religious thing. And listen, someone asked me during a Bible conference, was it? Yes, it was. It was during a Bible conference, it wasn't here. But they asked me, Jimmy, are you religious? I said, and it, it's, it's, I love how the Lord just gives the word immediately, the correct <laughs> thing that exposes my heart, exposes our hearts, so we can hate, so we can be open to what God has. I said, of course I am. In any area where the Lord himself has not appeared in my heart, I am a religious person. Because a religious person is, Paul de declared it, described it this way, a zeal for God without knowledge. And that knowledge is not my knowledge, not your knowledge. It's a zeal for God without the knowledge of God. The knowledge of God is his son, not things, not plurality. Paul also said it is the simplicity of Christ. Very simple. Very, very simple. I could ask you a question that I gave in as, as an exam here uh, last week. And one of the questions on this exam was, in, in very short words, in less than five words, define the crucified life. 
So I'll give you just a second to think about it. The crucified life, just very simple. Less than five words. It's this, not I, but. I can't move that finger. Christ. That's it. That's it. This happened the moment of new birth, whether we know that or not, whether we were taught that or not, whether we understood it or not. God the Father knows exactly what happened. Not I, but Christ. So the mindset while I was in Bible school was not to get the grade, not to get the diploma, not to pass and go continue to serve the Lord. It was actually this, to know the Lord regardless of the grade, or regardless of graduating, or regardless of the diploma. In my thought, in my thought, this was, this was my thought. If I fail a class, praise God, I get to take it again. See, I, I didn't know, I didn't know all this at that time. But see, the purpose of the class, to me, the purpose of the class was not really to pass the class regardless of the information being shared. The purpose of the class was so that in my heart there would be created this environment as there will be created in our hearts an environment during this whole week time that we're here. An environment in our heart where the Spirit of God can direct our heart, turn our heart away from the I, us, and lead and guide and bring our heart unto His Son. And that's a miracle of God. He is always doing this. And it's not, his son is not something or some anything, even, listen, even a person that we're going to find on the earth. No, 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 no. The true testimony of the angels. Why do you seek the living among the dead? He's not here. He's not here. He's risen. For us who are born again, our life is not found here below in what you can see with your natural eyes, in what you can understand with this natural brain, what we can put together with our mind, our natural mind, which is called the mind of Adam. No, no, no. To find peace, to find life, to find anything of God, we must find it in the Son of God Himself. Specifically, the risen Son. The eyes of our heart must be lifted above, out from below. And He does this throughout the Scriptures. We were talking uh, a few weeks ago with the youth, just how when Jesus walks on water, and, I mean, we can, we can say, well, that's, yes, God can do anything. He is above. Listen, he is above. And then so, but Peter, oh, wow, that's something different. That's a miracle. Peter walking on water, that's a miracle. Jesus, I can believe Jesus will walk on water, but Peter, no, that's a miracle. No, 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 that's not a miracle. The miracle was that actually Peter was coming to Jesus because that was the whole conversation Peter had with Jesus. If this is you, Lord, bid me to come to you. He didn't say anything. Okay, Lord, if that's you, I want to walk on water too. If this is you, Lord, if this is you, because they, if there was a storm going on on the Sea of Galilee. They couldn't really make out who it was. They thought it was a ghost at one point. They couldn't clearly make out who it was. Kind of like us. Can't really make out who the Lord is. We think, oh, the Lord's this over here. No, no, no. Requires the Spirit of God who woos us, who guides, guides us, brings us. If this is really you, Lord, bid me, cause me to come to you. And that's the miracle. But see, the miracle was above. Because as soon, we all know this, we, we know this, as soon as Peter's eyes fell from the object, listen, the object of faith, it's not faith for, it is faith unto the Son of God. Faith has an object, at least with the Father. The object of faith is Christ himself. Once we lose that object, hey, there's no faith. 
In fact, that's what Jesus uh, told Peter. Oh, you have little faith. Okay, so Peter starts sinking. The Lord draws him out from below, above, listen, unto himself. It is always above unto himself. Always unto a person, not unto a message, not unto a teaching, not unto a preaching, not unto something you can write down, study it, memorize it. Oh, I got it. I got this. <laughs> That's what that is, at least for the Holy Spirit. I got this. I got this one. I'm good. No, I'm not good. <laughs> so when I was in Bible school, um, I really didn't care if I graduated or not. Because I already, in my mind, I, I had already done the religious thing, I guess. And I wanted to know a person. I wanted to know the life that I'd been birthed of. And of course, my vocabulary has changed since then. I would say like light years changed, but it's completely changed and continues to change because that's the key. Once you begin knowing the Lord, hey, there's nothing else to know. You will not, you will not, I will not get bored with a person. You cannot. You will get bored with everything but. Now, it does require a miracle of God to draw our hearts to this person because we automatically gravitate just like Adam and Eve to what God calls death, right? The tree of life was always present, but somehow man just gravitates to death. No different than today. We just automatically, until the Spirit of God moves upon our heart, God the Father takes the initiative and draws our heart unto his Son again. So here was a, here was a thought um, when I was in Bible school that I was having. What if... I get the grade, what if I graduate and completely learn the message, the doctrine, the teaching, because around that time I began to like really look at what people would call, oh, like the original language and going and studying the historical, cultural context and bless you and, you know, all this stuff. What if I learn all this, the teaching, the message, the doctrine, get the academia down, and yet completely miss the Lord. What good is that? It's the same thing to, to today. You know? What if we who are born again, what if we are wherever we are doing whatever we're doing and completely miss the Lord? What good is that? What then is the point? Oh, well, he lived a good life. You can see the different ones in the scripture. I would say actually lived a good life <laughs> because the life they lived was Christ. And one of the most, uh, I guess in, in my heart, the most uh, prominent pictures is Abraham. Get this, Abraham, who God says that he obeyed my voice, get, obeyed my commandments. Everything that we, that we would kind of call the law, Abraham obeyed. But see, Abraham was how many, 400 years at least, 400 plus years before the law was given? How did he do that? He was led by the Spirit of God throughout the land to discover the one who fills both heaven and earth. That's it. Throughout the land. And you read that with the story of Abraham, and the Lord appeared. And then he goes on, and the Lord appeared. I... I also had this thought while in Bible school, and at some point, Tony, I want to talk to you some more. <laughs> Not because of anything you did, but you said something. And I want to hear more about it because when we, when we first talked, I, I, I took a Benadryl, so I wasn't really awake. <laughs> but um, but I, I, I was praying this, Lord, if you need to take a five-gallon bucket of ice water and throw it on me to wake me up 
unto the reality that I'm totally ignorant about, do it. Do whatever it takes. And at the time, I said, to change me. Completely ignorant that the change came at new birth. See, the father, would, the father looks at the born-again believer and he sees the change. This change is that life is now present where death was present before. Peace is present where chaos was present before. It's us who do not know. Because with my example of the pen, we have not seen. So we go about in a frantic for whatever. But listen, that whatever is always something on the earth. Something that the Father knows that truly does not satisfy. He actually created our soul. He, he created, fashioned, formed our soul for his son to be satisfied only with his son. He knows nothing else will do it. We're the ones who don't. All right? So the five-gallon bucket. So from the moment of new birth, the Holy Spirit is preparing our heart. Oh, I wrote this. <laughs> to be enrolled in the school of Christ. And that's where he becomes the teacher. Not the one speaking. Not the one reading that you're reading in the book. Now, he will use the one speaking. He will use what you're reading in the book. I mean, look at this. I've got a complete biblical library, New Testament, Greek, English dictionary right here. He will use that. Because for the Lord, if it has anything to do with the scripture, it's provision unto purpose. He will use it. He will use, he, this is almighty God. He will use whatever, whenever, however he sees fit. Because he knows our heart. He knows what will actually cut through the crud of our heart to direct our heart unto his son. He knows that. We don't know that. Oh, to, uh, yeah, to enroll us in the school of Christ, where all we learn is the Son. Oh, look at this. And he, <laughs> he loves us. He does. See, think of the testimony, all right? He loved Israel, who he brought into the land. He brought them to the place that he had prepared, the place that he wanted to make himself known to them. That's what the place was all about. It wasn't, it wasn't so much them getting their inheritance, though in the testimony it is, because it's the son who receives his inheritance, but because they were people, he brought them each step of the way to a place that was designed by him so that they could find him. They come out of Egypt. Well, actually, they go into Egypt. But why do they go into Egypt? You say, well, well there was a drought. Okay. Anywhere Joseph is, there is no drought. Anywhere Joseph is, there is no famine. You see? <laughs> It's not so much what he gives, it's who he is. If he is present, there is no famine present. There is no drought present. Salvation is present. The whole world came to Joseph for salvation. The whole world. He brings them out by the death of a lamb. But not just, okay, this is what you're going to do. You do this formula and then you're going to get out of Egypt. No, no, no. No. We know that later on, John the Baptist says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And then the following day, and all this is, this is specifically this way, and I love it. It says, you can read in the scriptures. It's there. It's in John, maybe chapter 3. John seeing Jesus. Now he has something to say. But what does he say? Well, we grew up together. He was my cousin. He's a good guy. No, no, no. He personifies the voice of the testimony. Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Sin has to be dealt with. What Adam did in the garden, that has to be dealt with. Now, 
the next day, John sees Jesus. Behold the Lamb of God. And I love the beautiful order of that. Once he says that, it says, and two of John's disciples left, basically they left John. Uh oh, they left the preacher. They left their teacher to follow Jesus. The true teacher. D do you see provision unto purpose? Now with that, I know that you guys are not thinking, oh, well, I can do whatever. No, no, no. If you're in a fellowship, you're there because God put you there. And he put you there with purpose. He knows the purpose. He provides for his purpose. Provision is always unto purpose. Everything that God does, everything he allows, everything he permits, everything is to direct our heart, to turn our heart, to bring our heart unto the person of his son. And yes, there's always a cost. There is. There's always a cost. But the way God sees it, the cost is nothing. See, to be born again, to be born again, it will cost us the death that we call life. There goes the redefining of what God has already defined. Sorry, brother, if you mentioned that later on in your session. <laughs> It's in my notes, too. Look, 527. It's right there. <laughs> I even put the dates on that. Yes. To be born again, it will cost you the death that you call life. The light of God. For the light of God, it will cost us. It will cost us the darkness that we call light. But what is this darkness? Our natural mind. The natural mind that can read something and say, oh, okay, I understand it now. Oh, okay, I got it now. Or get this, even read the scriptures and say, oh, I see the testimony of Christ here. Yes, the testimony serves a purpose. You search the scriptures. In the scriptures, you think you have eternal life. The script, those scriptures that you're searching and you're reading, they testify of me. It's a testimony, which testimony is designed to direct, to turn, to lead, guide, and bring unto the person. Because you will, without doubt, out, without doubt, get bored of a testimony. It will, after, after the kind of the, the ah, spiritual high, it will fade. But the son who is the eternal day does not fade. No. There is no night. There is no need of the moon, the stars. No. For God and the Lamb are the light thereof, an eternal day, <laughs> wherein is no darkness at all. Oh, look at this. I, I love this, the way the Lord sets it up. Now, we may think that the message is great. Let's just use an example. Here I am. I'm sharing with you what the Lord put on my heart. You may think that what I'm sharing is great. We may think that the teaching is great. We may think that the preaching is great. Get this, we may even think that the messenger is great. But what do we think of our Lord? See, the message, the teaching, the doctrine, the preaching, and the messenger Serve a purpose. Serve God's purpose. And if God is directing, it will serve his purpose. And that is to direct our hearts unto the greater than. The greater than who is present. The greater than Elisha. 
the greater than Moses, the greater than Abraham. I mean, that's one of the things they asked Jesus, are you greater than Moses? Or I can't remember who they used, than our fathers? <laughs> they existed because of me. They wouldn't have even existed except, listen, except I am, says the Lord. Oh yeah, here's that verse. Truly, truly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. And yet, like the woman at the well, you will come again, and you will come again, and you will come again, because that well testifies of the true well of living waters. That's what Jesus told her. I will give you living waters. You'll never have to come to this again. You come to me, you'll be. You think you're satisfied with that? Ha, ha, ha. No. Except the Spirit of God bring us, bring our heart. We really don't know what satisfaction is. It's true. It's true. Except the Spirit of God bring us to see the object of faith, where we still go about in our frenzy. We do. And God does not come with a big old belt, or in my case, uh, flip-flop, right? You guys may know that, the wadache. He doesn't come after us like that. No, 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 no. He knows. He knows. He does everything, anything, whenever, however he pleases. Because we don't know. We don't know that he created our heart for his son, to be satisfied with his son. We don't know that. He does. He does. And so even as, even as the children of Israel were in the wilderness, the Lord had brought them unto himself. The Lord was present in the midst. He knew that. God knows the truth. They didn't know the truth. They didn't walk in faith. I mean, they did not walk in faith. God knew that. Except he take the initiative. Except he take the initiative. The person who's not born again remains dead in their sins and trespasses and sins. That's it. They do, except God take the initiative. We who are born again, we remain in our ignorance and darkness that we call light and knowledge. But he does take the initiative. He does, because he always draws into his son. The, um, where was I? Oh, look at this. <laughs> We have excitement over a word definition, which I do. I get excited over word definitions. You can ask the kids. I love them. I, I love. I love because there's so, there's so much layers behind a language that we don't know, right? There, there's so many layers behind everything in the scripture that we just. I mean, cultural context. We just don't know. We don't know why the Jews got so upset when Jesus made a comment. The Jews know we're not Jews. We don't have that cultural context. But when we learn, it's like, oh my gosh, Lord, here you are declaring who you are, the Messiah, and they know. I mean, it's, it's, it's like the, the, what was it, the, one of the feasts, Jesus shows up and he says, if any man thirst, let him come to me. And I think during that feast, what was going on, you've got the priests and they're pouring water over the altar and it's running down testifying of living waters out from the throne of God. And I can, I can picture Jesus just kind of watching the whole religious thing going on, because that's what it is at that point. They've totally missed the purpose of the whole feast, testifies of Christ, and so Jesus kind of trying to, trying to bring it back to him. Well, <laughs> at least in their hearts, he knows it's always about him. If any man thirsts, let him come to me. And this is during a feast where they're doing stuff like that. So we can get excited over a definition, a message, etc., but we must allow the Holy Spirit in our heart to bring that word definition, that message, to the person of Christ himself. Then and only then, what God has provided has truly served purpose in our heart, in my heart, in your heart.
with Moses, and I'll just I'll just touch on this. I don't even know the time. Oh, whew. with with I'll just touch on this kind of view, like a little overview. Jesus said this after after he said that you know you search the scriptures, they testify of me, and you will not come to me. Uh, after he said that, he goes on saying a little bit, and then he says, "You don't believe Moses." At Moses, you can look at Moses as either Moses the person or uh, the law, the first five books of the law, the Torah, uh, because they, the Jews would say that Moses, it, when they would say, you know, read, I read Moses, okay, he, they read the law, right? So had you believed Moses, he said, you don't believe Moses, because had you believed Moses, you would believe me, because Moses wrote of me. And with that, the, the next session that I have, if I can get my notes organized, what I want to present is what Jesus declared. He said, in that day, you will know. I am in my Father, you are in me, and I am in you. But it's not, once again, this natural day that we find on the earth. Oh, it may happen on a natural day. But it's when our hearts are brought, our heart, our heart brought to where the Spirit of God, the moment of new birth, brought our heart, our soul. I think Paul said it's translated from one kingdom, the kingdom of darkness, into the kingdom of the son of his love. Immediate, immediate, the moment of new birth. Once again, the children of Israel, as they walked in the wilderness, yeah, the Lord had brought them unto himself. Death, burial, resurrection. We're going to look at that. Death, burial, and resurrection. It's there in the scriptures. Even the Lord, the Lord himself declared it to Moses to declare it to everybody else what he had done. On top of that, he gives them time and time, a testimony here, a testimony here, a testimony here, a testimony here. And I do want to read this uh, one passage because it's, it's basically, it's, uh, I found it interesting, the literal translation of this little part. But uh, this is actually in Deuteronomy. And this is the children of Israel speaking to Moses because, well, I'll just read it. These words the Lord spoke to you all, or excuse me, to all your assembly at the mountain from the midst of the fire of the cloud and the thick gloom with a great voice, and he had it no more. He wrote them on two tablets of stone and gave them to me. And when you heard the voice from the midst of the darkness, while the mountain was burning with fire, you came near to me, all the heads of your tribes and your elders, you said, Behold, the Lord our God has shown us his glory and his greatness, and we have heard his voice from the midst of the fire. We have seen today that God speaks with man, yet he lives. It goes on. And yet I live. It goes on. Now then, look at this, verse 20. This is actually Deuteronomy 5.25. Now then, why should we die? Redefining what God has already defined. No, they were dead in Egypt. Why should we die? For this great fire will consume us. Actually, once again, the cost of knowledge is our ignorance. That's what it will cost us. What we believe is our life, which is not our life at all. For this great fire will consume us if we hear the voice of the Lord our God any longer, then we will die. For who is there of all flesh who has heard the voice of the living God speaking from the midst of the fire as we have and lived? Well, I could name one, Moses. But see, Moses did not live by his life when the Lord appeared in the burning bush. No, he lived by the life of another. Where's Tom? Caleb, the same thing. He did not live by his life. He lived by the life of another. Because 40 years later, I don't know how old Caleb was, but he's sure not the spring chicken that he was when he came out of Egypt. 
But he says this, give me my mountain because my strength has not diminished since we first went in to spy the land. My vitality has not diminished. He found the Lord who was his strength, who was his ability, who was his vitality. And then verse 21, look at this. This is what the children of Israel said. Go near, well, Moses. And that literally is this. Go yourself, Moses. And hear all that the Lord our God says. Then speak to us all that the Lord our God speaks to you. And we will hear it and do it. I'll just sum it up. You go, Moses, and meet with God and just tell us what to do. That's a religious mindset. That's religion. Just tell me what to do. Just, just you know, like, hey, Jimmy, you're speaking. Just tell me what to do. How about this? How about ask the Lord to do whatever it takes to get your attention to shake you, to wake you, to wake me out of our little sleep and slumber. So that we may live where our life is found. Did you get that? Live where your life is found. That doesn't even make sense in the natural. Unless, well, yeah. No, it doesn't make sense if you don't know where your life is. It doesn't make sense if you don't know who your life is. Live where our life is found. Walk where our life is found. Exist where our life is found. See, the Father knows the truth. The Father knows the Son. We're the ones who don't know. But once again, He is working by His Spirit that we may come from our ignorance unto His knowledge, from our darkness unto His light. I can't say from death unto life. He's already done that the moment of new birth. But see, we always want to try to find what we're looking for down here on the earth. We do. We do. All of us. I don't even have it. My pen. I found it. And I'm good now for a short time until something else happens. Everything. Everything that we want to get this. And this is hard to grasp. I know it's hard to grasp. It's hard. It's, you cannot grasp it with your natural mind. It makes no sense with your natural mind. It makes no sense in my natural mind. Everything that I desire, everything that I truly desire, everything that I truly want, everything that I truly long for, I will only be able to find it in the person of God's Son. as the person himself. See, we don't come to Jesus to find something that he gives us. Okay, here you go. No, no. We come to Jesus to find what we're looking for, and we discover he's what we're looking for. Remember Philip? I think it was Philip. It might have been Philip. Lord, show us the Father, and, and that's sufficient. I'll be satisfied. It's sufficient for me. Just show me the Father. If, I don't know if Jesus, if they did this back in antiquity, but he could do this, right? Philip, what you're looking for, you can only find in me. If you want to see the Father, listen to this, listen to this. And see, I, I can say this, right? Parents divorced at the age when I was four. He is a father to the fatherless. I can say this. Oh, and you, you who have had fathers and you think that they're good? No, they compare nothing to our Father in heaven. They compare nothing to him. Nothing. Everything that we want, everything that we look for, everything that we truly desire down here can only be found in God's Son above.
Abraham saw this one. I mean, the, I know the Jews, they know this. They, they say that, that the Lord brought, when it says the Lord brought Abraham abroad and showed him the heavens, he showed him that which fills the heavens. Get this, the seed that fills the heavens, the seed singular that fills the heavens, the risen Christ. All the, Jews, all the Jewish rabbis say, yes, he was brought outside of time. He was brought into the eternal to see this. And he kept, he kept, and the Lord appeared, and he kept, and he kept, and the Lord appeared. Continuing to discover just how great this one is, just how about Jesus it really is. Everything. Oh yeah, so Jesus says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. He could even speak to our own heart. If you've seen me, you've seen your peace. If you've seen me, you've seen your righteousness. If you've seen me, you've seen your life. When that happens, here we go, my example of the pen. When that happens, our restlessness stops. Because we have found by the Spirit what we have truly, listen, truly been looking for. We have found the object of our affection, the person of our affection the person that we've substituted with all these other things on the earth, regardless. Uh, a pen, the precious. Another person, my spouse. We have even misdefined love. God hasn't. God is love. You, you want to know the love of God? Jesus says, if you've seen me, you've seen the love of God. I mean, I, I, down here on the earth, I, we, we, we use the term love, and we don't even know what it means. We define with our natural mind, our carnal mind, the same mind of the first man, Adam. We give it, listen, we give it a corruptible definition. Because that is here today, gone tomorrow. But not the son, he's eternal. And see, that's another thing, too. And we'll, we'll definitely touch on this. That's another thing, too. Anytime, anytime you see them crossing water, that's a burial. And you always have to think this way, three days. Because it's there with Moses, it's, it's there with Joshua, three days. Death, burial, resurrection. But what do you bury? Do you bury a live person? That's what we think, right? No, you bury a dead person. The problem is we think that dead person is alive and was our life when it's not. So I don't know how far I've gone. No one's given me any flags or anything that I can see of, but I, but I think I'm starting to lose some people because everyone's kind of dozing off. <laughs> I did drink my vein energy. So, uh, oh, look at that. No way. But I'll just, I'll just end with that, that the Lord, he does bring us unto his son. And once that begins, then it doesn't end, at least not for him. So please, 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 Take everything that I presented, please present it to the Holy Spirit, because if it's just something that you heard that I presented, then it's still not it. You, we still don't got it. It, it. it comes to its, what is it, fruition, I guess you could say, when our hearts turn to see the object himself, Jesus. Lord bless. We'll see you in the evening.